Good evening. Welcome to our special Tuesday evening service. We're doing it Tuesday night this week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. We trust that God is blessing you in a very special way. We're going to switch gears for just a little bit tonight as we look at a testimony of thankfulness. We find this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. We're going to be looking at Paul tonight for just a few minutes. Paul had just finished wrestling again with the essence, as he says, of the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In doing so now, Paul literally exploded into a joyous celebration of his own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as you read about Paul and his ministry, Paul and his salvation experience, he never got too far away from his conversion experience. In other words, Paul continued to not reflect on how he had been, but thanking God for the life that God has given him now. The message that comes through Paul's story, I believe, is the assurance for us that if Christ can change him, Literally, Christ can change anyone tonight. The essence of the gospel, of course, is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. So the essence of the Christian witness, us as believers, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the essence then of the Christian witness is telling the story about how Jesus has changed our life. We see, first of all, this evening, Paul as he remembers his past. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, and the first part of verse 13, the Bible says, And I, speaking of Paul, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. Note how he remembers things here. He's looking now at the the person of his salvation in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. Literally, Paul is giving credit where credit is due. Paul is basically saying, Lord, I owe my whole life to you. Paul's thanksgiving is literally for God's grace. John MacArthur said, and I quote John MacArthur, Grace may be defined as God's loving forgiveness by which he grants exemption from judgment and the promise of temporary and eternal blessings to the guilty and condemned sinners freely without any worthiness on their part and based on nothing they have done or failed to do. God's salvation is because of what he has done for us in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. Paul also looks at the power of his salvation as well in verse 12. Paul says, who has enabled me? Or who has given me? Who has filled me with this power? The Bible tells us in the New Testament book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That should remind us that no matter what we may be facing, If we are praying about a situation and we're thinking maybe we cannot do it, if God is impressing upon us to do it, remember the Bible says that we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. For we understand that even today, Jesus Christ never gives a person a job to do without giving them the power to do it as well, or without giving them the touch to do it as well. So grace literally here is the ability to obey. Then Paul also in verse 12 talks about the principle of his salvation. He says, because he, because the Lord counted me faithful. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 25 says, as I whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Augustine said, God does not choose a person who is worthy, but by the act of choosing him, he makes him worthy. In other words, God doesn't choose me because I think 
I am God's gift to the church or because I think I am God's gift to the world. God chooses me. And then as I humble myself before him, he makes us worthy of the calling which he has given to us. The word faithful that Paul uses is actually a reference to Paul's worth in God's sight. Paul was a worthy worker for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior this evening, I hope that the Lord can say of you and that the Lord can say of me that we are worthy workers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then also in verse 12 of uh, chapter 1, Paul mentions the phrase, putting me into the ministry. In other words, Paul realizes right now that he was saved to serve. Now, once again, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior tonight, you were not saved to soak. You were saved to serve. In other words, you were not saved just to sit and not read your Bible, to sit and not pray, to sit and not tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You were saved to serve. You were saved to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves. Why? It is the gift of God, not of works, not of anything that I did, not of anything that I tried to earn. Because that last phrase says, lest anyone should boast. You see, if I had to earn my salvation, then the Lord knows that there is a good chance that we will go about telling people, look what we did. Look what I did to get my salvation. But it's not of works, nothing that we could have done. However, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 also speaks of the purpose of his grace. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul's reward was to serve. Now, let that soak in for just a moment tonight. First of all, are you serving Christ tonight? Secondly, you might say, well, preacher, I am serving the Lord tonight, but I'm tired, or it gets to be a drudgery. Understand your salvation. Understand what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, to bring you eternal life. Paul considered it a privilege. Paul considered it a reward to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you tonight, when Christians all over the world realize that it is our privilege, it is our reward to work for Jesus Christ, I think it will change our outlook. Then in verse 13, Paul gets to the past before his salvation, before Jesus Christ came into Paul's life. Paul said, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, that just means violent man. Paul remembers how he was. And Paul looks at this as being a liability right now. Because before Paul asked Jesus to come into his life, Paul literally denied Jesus Christ's deity. Paul often spoke of the Lord in, in derogatory terms. Paul often slandered people and the Lord as well. Paul literally, literally used physical power to try to destroy the Lord's church. Physically imposing his will upon believers of that day. Paul says, at that time, I was violently arrogant toward believers. He said, I was proud. I was rude. I believe our modern day word for that would be, Paul was a bully. He was literally out to inflict pain on believers just for the joy of it. But then we find, secondly, Paul starts to reflect on his present. Verses 13, 14, and 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
Paul says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom, whom I am the chief. So we see that it was by mercy and grace that Jesus Christ saved this sinner. You know what Paul says? He says this grace was exceedingly abundant. Paul is just saying that God's grace was super abounded toward him. I believe he adds the adverb to expand it. It's more than enough. His grace was more than enough to save me. As we look at verse 15, the Bible says that Christ Jesus came into the world by his incarnation, by his birth that we are celebrating in just a few weeks, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am the chief, of whom I feel like I was the worst sinner ever was. But if you look at a statement that we read already in verse 13, Paul says, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, understand here, Paul's explanation of this was not intend intended to diminish his guilt, was not intended to diminish everything he had done. But Paul here is, is putting his sin into the category of a sin of ignorance instead of a presumptuous sin. In other words, Paul said, I was unsaved. I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't realize that the Lord Jesus Christ actually died on the cross for my sins. We look at Jesus' prayer in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what they're doing. And that's also the principle of Romans chapter 7 and verse 9 that says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Paul now, instead of glamorizing his past wickedness, instead of saying, hey, look what I did. Look at all the trouble I caused unbelievers. Paul now just simply lets us know what he did. And he says, I, I did it in, in ignorance of who Jesus Christ really was. And that may bring us a question of why should we remember our sin? Commentator William Barclay, he offers some reasons. And I quote from him, he says, The memory of his, speaking of Paul's sin, was the surest way to keep him from pride. Isn't it the same with us tonight? Also, Barclay says, The memory of his sin was the surest way to keep his gratitude aflame or his gratitude on fire remembering how he used to be, but thanking God for the life he's given to him now. Then also the memory of his sin was the constant urge to a greater effort. Remember, Paul has said that he considers it now a reward for him to be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And also Barclay says the memory of his sin was bound to be an encouragement for others. Can you imagine as people who used to know Paul, of course, as Saul, looked at him. Oh, I'm sure that at first, we know at first people doubted whether or not he was saved. I'm sure there were others as well that were thinking or saying, okay, he's changed a little bit now, but we will see how it goes later on down the road. But now they're able to see, hey, this guy has been really changed, and he says it's because of Jesus Christ. Oh, and now we get to see Paul's rejoicing in his potential. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul says, However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, Invisible to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever 
and ever. Amen. Paul shows us here in verse 16, shows his life as a pattern. God wanted to make a public display of his grace to a notable, to a well-known sinner such as Paul so that other sinners might look on him and basically say, hey, if Jesus Christ can change Paul, if Jesus Christ can forgive Paul of all of his sins because of everything he's done, surely he can save me as well. Mercy just refers to God's pity for the miserable, for the unsaved. Long-suffering. Unlimited patience. Many years ago in a Sunday school class, I asked a question. What does mean long what does long suffering mean to you? There was a young man there that was very quiet. He and his wife had been married about eight or nine years. He very seldom made a comment, but as soon as I asked what does long suffering mean to you, he immediately responded by saying, Living with my wife for all these years. I'm not so sure that's the right definition, but long suffering, unlimited patience that holds out under provocation, patience that, that holds out under stress. You know, I, I've seen a lot of believers through the years that act one way when things are going great, but when they get under a lot of stress, if anyone ever confronts them, it's like they're a totally different person. And then Paul says, everlasting life. Paul is saying now that I am a believer, now that I have Jesus Christ into my life, I still had to live on this earth, but my life now is fuller. My life now is richer because of Christ. And Paul is saying, I realize that one day when I get to be with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that heavenly life will be totally unending. The joy, the excitement that Paul has in his life. Now think back just a, a little while ago. Paul was there at the stoning of Stephen. Why did they stone Stephen? For his faith in Jesus Christ. Paul very well could have been a part of this. Now, Paul, as a believer, knows the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Can you imagine the day in heaven when Stephen and Paul met? I believe it was nothing but a time of rejoicing. In verse 17, also shows us Paul's life is now given to praise. He said, to the King eternal, to the King of the ages. And we know tonight that, that God has no beginning. God has no end. God exists out of time, though he acts within time. To the King eternal. He says, immortal. Just simply means imperishable, incorruptible, that ever will be. It speaks of God's unchanging nature. Invisible. We know God is invisible and he can only be known by self-revelation. There's none other God but God Almighty. Paul says to the God alone who is wise, the only true God, the truth of the scripture. He says, be honor and glory forever and ever. We are to esteem God, brag about God. Brag about his salvation. Acknowledge his majesty and his power. I ask you tonight, how is your salvation? How is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Thanksgiving is just two days away. How is your thankfulness? How is your gratitude? Oh, I'm thankful tonight that I'm saved. I'm thankful for my wife of over 44 years who have put up with me. She's probably about the only one who could have put up with me for that long. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my daughter-in-laws, my grandchildren, my family. I'm thankful for my Temple Church family. I'm thankful for the friends God has given to me. I'm thankful for the place of service that God has placed me here at Temple. There's a song, perhaps one of my favorite songs, We Will Remember. 
I trust that is your desire tonight, that you will remember what Christ has done for you. I'm not going to sing the song tonight, but I'm going to read the words. We will remember. We will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness. The song goes on. You are our creator. You're our life sustainer. You're our deliverer. You're our comfort. You're our joy. Throughout the ages, the song says, you have been our shelter, our peace in the midst of the storm. With signs and wonders, oh, you've shown your power. With precious blood, you've showed us your grace. You've been our helper, our liberator. You've been uh, the giver of life with no end. And then when we walk through life's darkest valleys, we all have those from time to time. When we walk through those times, we will look back at all you have done. And we will shout, our God is good. And he's the faithful one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the one from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the one whose glory has been shown. And then... I still remember the day you saved me. You remember that day? The day I heard you call out my name. You said you loved me and would never leave me. And praise God, I've never been the same. I trust that can be your testimony tonight. I trust that can be your praise tonight. I trust that can be your thanksgiving tonight. Father, once again, you've been so good to us. Even when we did not deserve your goodness, you're still there loving us, ever being so good to us. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us tonight in your very own, very special way. Help us to realize just a minute amount of what you've done for us. Help us to give you all the glory and all the praise. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I trust that everyone will have a great day. Thanksgiving. I would say don't eat too much, but that's one day of the year that probably a lot of us do. Be praying for our services Sunday, this coming Sunday, our 9 o'clock service, and then our 1030 services online. A special service at our 9 o'clock service, we will be having another baptism. We had a baptism a couple of weeks ago. We have another baptism this coming Sunday morning. Please be praying for the service, if at all possible, either be with us in person or join us online. May God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. We love you.